Good evening, everyone. It's an absolute pleasure to be here with all of you today at this uh, Neuropsychiatry Roundtable, uh, which is being co hosted by Apollo Hospital with Bodhi Clinic and the International Neuropsychiatry and Association. Uh, neuropsychiatry as a specialty actually lives in the body. Partners who complement each other 
we found that there are new ways to enhance what we have already been delivering to the patient. So borrowing the best of what they have and putting it together with what Apollo does really well, we have come up with this new premium health check. When any new product is put on the market, there is always a latent period for people to get aware of it and for the adoption to rise. So I think in the next few months, we will see that all these concepts will get integrated into our health check programs. And we will now have a very powerful health check program that looks at a patient who walks into our health check facility in a much more holistic way. So this is just one example that I can offer of how working with uh, uh, his team, Dr. ESK's team, will actually enhance the value that we deliver. And it is not just about this. We know that today, chronic illnesses and non-communicable diseases are, have taken root in our society and are fast displacing the infectious diseases. 15 years back or 20 years back, our visit to the doctor was typically a short-lived encounter. You fell sick, maybe you had fever, you felt unwell, you went to the doctor, he gave you some medicine, three days later you were fine. And that was how we remember our interactions with doctors. These were episodes, in most instances, far apart. Today when we deal with this epidemic of chronic illness, diabetes, coronary artery disease, chronic kidney disease, now the relationship with your doctor is not an episodic one separated by months or years in between. This relationship is now a partnership. And the stronger the partnership, the better will be the outcome for the patient. So what do we mean when we say partnership? Whatever the doctor can offer you, and I was speaking to one of Dr. ESK's oldest patients, so I will take the liberty of quoting exactly what he said. He said 40% the doctor does for you. If he is a good diagnostician, he makes a good diagnosis, he puts you on the correct medicine, 40% he does. 40% the patient has to do, making sure you follow the advice, making sure you participate in the treatment, making sure you escalate whatever needs to be told to the doctor appropriately. So 40% comes from the doctor, 40% comes from the patient and 20% you have to give to the Almighty. I think that's a fair summary of the kind of partnerships we are building today. So we need to walk together, doctor and patient, within the system to ensure that the patient gets the best possible outcomes. Because these are not diseases which can be cured. These are diseases which need to be managed. And in order to manage them effectively, we need new collaboration, we need more powerful collaboration, we need a transdisciplinary approach. This is a word I actually learned from Dr. ESK because he uses it very often. So a transdisciplinary approach is the need of the hour. Just another one last point I'd like to make, and this approach has to start as early as possible. So if, you, if there is a problem, the earlier it is diagnosed, the better is going to be the outcome. So with uh, these few words, I'd like to again uh, compliment Dr. ASK and his team for putting together this neuropsychiatry roundtable. It's an absolute privilege for Apollo Hospital to associate with you. And I hope you're laying a foundation of a partnership that will get stronger as we go ahead. I'd like to thank all of you who've come here today to participate in the function. And above all, the speakers for today's function, who Dr. Balsama has traveled all the way from Sydney to be here with us, and uh, so have our other speakers. So I think uh, we, we will definitely benefit from their wisdom and their insight, and we will take something back from this function. Thank you. What are you going to tell you? The podium, sir. Sir, wait, 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 wait. Sir, podium full of material, sir. Podium, podium. What are you going to update the link of three people? Podium, podium.
सही पे सर सर Different. 
So the area of pleasure might be the same in every brain, but what stimulates that area is different for me, different for you, different for somebody else. Somebody enjoys reading, somebody enjoys music, somebody I, I agree that over a period of time you tend to like, take the pleasure. Repeatedly you do it, most probably the pleasure gets reinforced, re repeated. So these are all things which we need to study and I think there is a lot of a journey to travel for neuropsychiatry. At present it looks a bit clumsy. Like the visions which we have in psychiatry like schizophrenia, mania, depression. They may not be the categories which really they are. Perhaps a day should come where we have something like I'm sure Dr. Rudra would be talking about the autoimmunity, inflammations. So perhaps depending on the some autoimmunity mechanisms or inflammation of some area of the brain, they could influence the executive function, they could influence the visceral function, they could influence the emotional function, they could influence the uh, I mean, cognitive functions. So depending on the, which functions are affected by what type of mechanism, perhaps the expression of that would be depicted as an illness. Currently we are in a state where we do make categories like a few disorders, but unfortunately nature doesn't follow those categories. That's why you have some uh, mood, dis mood symptoms in schizophrenia, some schizophrenia symptoms in obsessive compulsive disorder, some obsessive compulsive symptoms in uh, I mean somewhere else. But for lack of better classification system, for lack of better, I think, nosological terms, we use this to communicate. There is nothing wrong in that, but we need to work on this further. I once again congratulate Dr. Krishnamurti for making such a beautiful arrangements and also taking psychiatry at a higher level than what it really is today. And I hope Indian Psychiatric Society would take a leap out of this book, would try to do whatever the best we can do from that angle. And once again, I thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity and wish this conference a grand success. Thank you.
and neurodevelopmental disorders. But if you start when the child is starting school to recognize there is a difference in the development, you've already missed the boat because your brain is highly plastic. 90% of your brain development happens before the age of five. So if you are identifying a child with a developmental problem, when they start school, say, oh, why is he or she not talking? Or why is he or she not making friends? It's too late. So that's why we need to be really focusing a lot on the first 2,000 days. That's from pregnancy to the start of school. That's because when our brain is developing, what it's doing is making a lot of connections. And you can see in pregnancy that 36 weeks, it's ready to make those connections. By the time you're born at birth, it's reaching out to make the connections. By six months, it's almost like a bush. And by two years, it's almost like a forest. Because those connections have really formed. And all what you do after three, four years of age is select the ones you are using, consolidate it, and prune away the ones you are not using. For a child with a developmental problem, if you are only identifying them at the age of four or five or six, what are you building on? Your building blocks are not there for you to build on. But if you start at really early at 12, 18 months of age, you've got the maximum chance of making that connection as much as possible to connect well. And this is an example of brain development in terms of time. So the bottom line, if you look there, most of your vision, your hearing, your habitual ways of responding, your peer social emotional connection or who this person is, what that person means to me, then you have lost that connection, you have lost that social opportunity. So language or communication becomes a way in which we interact socially and in kids with autism it could be totally not there or maybe some differences or maybe that they call well developed speech but the way they use it is different. And it's said that in Silicon Valley there's a lot of geek syndrome, which is they are very mechanically minded. They want to be solving those problems, whereas we would be saying, oh, when is my brain? When am I going to see my mate? But they can really get absorbed. You can make great nuclear physicists, as Alan Gansman, as a Newton have been said to have had these traits. So to a certain extent, that, that can be highly functional, but that's at the exclusion of the social relational aspects of your life. So the biology of the brain in autism is such that you're not interested in the external world. So if a chair came to me and said, let's play out, they go away and leave me alone. It's how they feel. They don't realize that others have got feelings, others have got what, let, let you know what those feelings are. So when you call the child or try to say, hey, look, you make a lot of these interactional, connectional stuff, in, in those schooling and sensory social routines. But kids with autism are not interested. And they will scream and shout and say, leave me alone. So with time, what happens is that parents and others leave them alone to do their own things or their little interests and be there. You should be doing the exact opposite. As early as possible, you should be catching them, identifying them, and giving them a lot of stimulation so that they, they can develop. And this is a, 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 a great study from a very old study from, from Chicago. Three-year-old children were taken. <coughs> Two years they were given preschool program from, from low socioeconomic status. And after that, did nothing. The children who got the intervention had much better educational status, higher achievement, on-time graduation, etc. So the return on investment, this is from the Heckman equation, he got the Nobel Prize in Economics. $1 to $13 if you invest really early. But as you grow later, that's where the politicians and the government will put money because they get their return 
on the ballot box. You need to wait a very long time to see the investment in the early areas. But that said, as a country, we should be going. But if you fail today's children, we are going to fail tomorrow's society. Thank you very much. And you do have psychiatric presentations in many, many different uh, vascular disorders, whatever. But today I want to talk about, uh, I want to present you two cases with autoimmune disorders who turn out to have autoimmune disorders. And there's sometimes rather a long way to get to that insight. And uh, the whole story began uh, in, in, with this paper, the, the story of the autoimmune and the uh, so the insight that psychiatric presentations may be caused by immunological diseases uh, really started in 2008 with uh, the discovery of the anti nmda receptor ankyphalitis. And um, this is the first lady we discovered or found in 2009, my first patient with the NMDA receptor ankyphalitis. She was a 31-year-old patient who until that age, so for three decades of her life, was perf per perfectly sorry, fit and well, no history of psychiatric disorder whatsoever in the family. But then suddenly, out of the blue, she was uh, working in, in a big company uh, as uh, secretary to the big boss, and so she had a very high functional level. And then suddenly, within weeks, she developed hallucinations, delusions, paranoid ideas, and all began with a set of three seizures. So that was why at the very beginning everybody thought that must be something neurologically, uh, neurological. And so she was sent to a university department for neurology where she was diagnosed based on the high level of the university hospital. And they didn't find anything. So they referred her back and they said this is not neurological. And to give you an idea of what it looked like, I have brought you these two videos. And um, after that, she was treated for two years in different psychiatric hospitals in, in uh, South Germany under the diagnosis of catatonic schizophrenia. And uh, here, the note, you see another. <coughs> this is, of course, in German, but I have translated it to you. Like the other videos. Suffering from catatonic schizophrenia, 
but from the neurological brain disease called anti-NMDR receptor encephalitis, a disease where autoantibodies in the body dock to brain structures and then in turn lead to dysfunction of the infected brain areas. You can see the dysfunction here, and you saw the clinical picture in the first movie. And then after uh, immunotherapy, so after having learned that this is not catatonic schizophrenia, but rather NMDA receptor encephalitis, uh, we treated this patient not with neurolepsis <coughs> but with auto uh, with immune therapy. And this is just again a germ, of course, but it just give you an, uh, an impression of what she looked like later. Cortisone and then see what happened. 
what we are talking about is neurological causes for mental health conditions as well as neurological complications and disability that are associated with mental health conditions. But we are also talking about psychiatric consequences of neurological conditions. So it's, it's quite a, uh, an important clinical spectrum and it's one that we deal with not just in the clinic, not just in hospital, but also in community and public health. And hence, therefore, it's important. Now, what happens as you age? Most of the affected areas are what we call the polymodal and association cortices. Uh, we don't seem to have it, so check me. You wake up in the morning to a smell. It's not a very pleasant smell, but it makes you happy because you know you're close to home. Right? And that's the same part of the brain that the rat shares with you, which is why the rat has a very good smell memory. Right? So this is the oldest part of the human brain. It's not just a series of pathways, it's an extremely chemical rich part of the human brain. And this gets affected as we get older and that's something for all of us to keep in mind. Now what happens also is that you have problems with blood flow and glucose metabolism. And I'll show you a picture in a short while. And that affects uh, you know, your brain. You also have a problem in the neurochemistry. There is a decline in the dopamine transporter system. So this is the reason why, as you age, you not only have problems with memory and cognition, as we call higher brain function, you also have physical problems with movement, motor functioning. And of course, at an extreme, that's what causes things like Parkinson's disease. But both these things are part of the aging process. Now this, the hippocampus, is a part of your brain that's critical in your memory. So if you draw a line between your ears, right in the middle is your hippocampus. It's just the size of a finger joint. But yet it stores your entire life's memory. And how does it store it? It stores it like you would store files in an office, in sequential order. Which is why when you're affected by a degenerative disease of your brain, you lose your newest memories first and you retain your oldest memories. So people, for example, forget the grandchildren in the family, then the sons, uh, sons-in-law and daughters-in-law because they came later into the family, then the children, then the spouse, then the siblings, then the parents. And one reason why dementia is called a fate worse than death is that finally you forget who you are. You lose your own identity as a human being and nothing could be worse than that for anyone. So that's the kind of progression that happens when it you know, gets to memory loss. This is again a PET scan image and what I want to show you is that if you see in the images below with the arrows, you can see how there is hypometabolism uh, and this is what you see in a person whose brain is aging, in a person who's developing dementia. And that's something that we need to understand. And that's, of course, what we were talking about, the cerebral metabolism. What happens also as you get older, picture this. A young person's going to the airport to board a flight. They get delayed, they land up late in the airport, and someone says, oh, gate is closed, sir. You can't get it. Okay, it is close, man. You can't get it. A young person immediately starts thinking, can I get another flight? Can I go and catch a train? Can I go get a bus? How do I get there? Older people stand there and get terribly upset and annoyed. Right? And one of the reasons for this is as you get older, you have a difficulty or an inability to shift set. You're not able to move from one train track that you're on mentally to another train track. It becomes more and hard, it's harder and harder for people. The other thing that happens as you age is that it's your short-term memory that is primarily affected. 
your long term memory, your memory of how to do things, for example, how to ride a bicycle or how to drive a car, those things are retained, but your short term memory goes. So you will be often meet people, if you ask them what did you have for breakfast this morning, they will struggle to tell you what they had for breakfast this morning. But if you ask them about something, uh, you know, uh, from the past, they will give you all details. Oh, I went to see this NGR movie, it was with my wife and, you know, uh, we had just been married, I can tell you the whole story because that comes from the past. So that's another feature of getting older. There is something called the concept of working memory. And the working memory is really what we call the executive brain. It helps you plan, it helps you organize, it helps you complete the round of tasks that you want to do. It helps you do it in a sequence that is appropriate. You will have a meal waiting for you when we finish this meeting. Right? It's your working memory that tells you start with the starters, then go to the main course and finally go to the desert. If your working memory is not working very well, you will kind of mishmash it uh, and not really follow any particular plan. So that's what your working memory is all about. And that gets affected uh, as you get older. Okay. So there is a loss of efficiency in acquiring cognitive or higher mental function information. There is a problem with processing speed. You'll notice that as we get older, we take time to absorb things. We take more time to respond to a question or respond to something. We slow down. And that's part and parcel of cognitive aging. All your old information, as I said, is spared. There's one point I want to make, because especially in middle age, I get people coming to me, oh, you know, I'm really worried about my memory. And the point I want to make is the most common reason why you have subjective forgetfulness, I'm losing my memory, is being stressed out or depressed. It's not losing your memory. Okay? This changes as you get older, but this is very true in the middle years. So one of the things to always ask yourself when somebody says I'm losing my memory is to find out whether they actually are experiencing symptoms of stress, anxiety or depression or something else that's going on. Now, one of the other factors that we have to understand is that there is a transitional period. And this transitional period from normal aging, what used to be called in the old days benign sense and forgetfulness, to mild cognitive impairment, to dementia, frank dementia. The mild cognitive, sorry, the mild cognitive impairment is the time when you can treat. Because people don't come to you and say, I'm normal when you treat me. People come to you when they start having a problem. And MCI is a very critical time for us to treat. And that's something, so early diagnosis, becomes very important and in this context going through memory tests as part of a master health check for example is very important. Now why do we have problems with aging? We often meet people who post retirement there's a sudden drop in my 40 years of service. I had a nice retirement party, I went home and from the next day all I'm doing is reading the newspaper, going for walks, I'm not doing anything very active with my brain anymore. That can cause cognitive aging. One of the other things are little strokes and I'm going to talk about that. As the blood supply gets worse, you have small strokes in your brain. They are not large enough to cause you alarm. They don't give you things like hemiparesis. But what they do is that they cut off little wires in your brain. And those circuits are important to you. And that's one of the reasons why you do cognitive age. And the third, of course, is the degeneration, the pathological aging that we are talking about. Now, here is a picture, an MRI, of somebody who is having multiple strokes in their brain. And this white that you see around the ventricles, the dark bags in your brain, the white that you see should not really be there. The white is a sign of poor perfusion. It's called leukoaliosis. And if you have poor blood perfusion, then you have what we call lacuna infarcts, which are little strokes. And these have the impact of cognitively slowing you down. But today we understand it's not just cognitive impairment. They cause Parkinsonism, 
So people with vascular Parkinsonism walk with a very small step gait. The French call it marche à petit pas. Uh, so they, it's almost magnetic. It's almost like my feet are stuck to the ground. And late life depression is very strongly associated with poor blood supply in the brain. So we often attribute late life depression to psychosocial factors like loneliness and losing people in your life and so on. But this is the understand underlying biology for many people, that they have poor blood supply in their brain and that's what's causing them to get depressed. So what underlies cognitive aging? On the one hand, you have the hold factors, hypertension, obesity, lipids or high cholesterol, diabetes. All these are preventable. All these advancing causing problems. On the other hand, you have factors which are lifetime factors. Sleep, exercise, diet, and mental health. All these also are preventable, but this prevention starts earlier. Right? So in some ways, most of us when we are 40 or 45, that's when we think about starting to walk, right? Or starting to exercise regularly. Uh, I meet a lot of young people today who exercise regularly from the time they are in their teens, and they are doing the right thing. Okay, so you the earlier you start to live a good lifestyle in terms of diet and exercise and sleep, the more protected you are from cognitive aging. So those are preventive factors too. In the middle, the colorful pictures are the pathology that happens in dementia. To put it very simply, waste product deposits itself in our brains. There's amyloid and tau. And neuroscientists have spent years fighting with each other as to which is more important. And today we know they are both important. They're both important in different ways. They both influence each other. But we know something else today. These risk factors, hypertension, obesity, diabetes, high cholesterol, we thought they only had something to do with the circulation and therefore heart health and strokes. Today we know they are also responsible for the amyloid and the tongue. Okay, so in a sense all this is interlinked and it's all like a cascade that's waiting to happen and when that cascade sets in, that's when you advance from normal cognitive aging to mild cognitive impairment and finally dementia. Uh, and that's the understanding that today we have about brain aging. Dementia is an extremely important condition because we're going to have an epidemic of it. You know, we talk all, about ourselves as the world capital of diabetes. I can tell you we're not far from being the world capital of dementia. There's only one reason, right? We have a large population and that large population is starting to live longer and longer. And dementia is a disease of age. The longer you live, the more likely you are to experience dementia. So this is something that all of us need to keep in mind. We have, uh, as per estimates, about 5 million people with dementia living in India today, and that number will probably go up to 7 million in the not so distant future. You can imagine the public health need, you can imagine the clinical need, you can imagine the disability needs. They are extremely considerable. It's not normal aging, and that's something that's very, very important. You know, we have this thing in society, you always become old, and that's why it's become forgetful. Dementia is not normal aging, because dementia causes disability. You can't do the things that you could do before. And progressively, you need more and more help in order to get through your normal day. And as dementia progresses, people need to be led to the bathroom, people need to be assisted in their everyday ablutions, people need to be fed, people need to be kept safe, people need to be prevented from wandering from their house. It's a lot of stress on the caregiver. And there's something else that's happening in India. The caregivers, which are the families, are disappearing. How many people do you meet who are living in an extended family uh, who are able to care for somebody with dementia today in urban India? Difficult. And if you look at people who are middle-aged like myself, I don't know who will be there to care for me if I get dementia. Right? 
So this is a challenge that we are not addressing and that's one of the reasons it's a scary epidemic because the needs are going to be so great. These are global trends and what I'd like to emphasize here is that deaths are affected. Uh, the blue line is India and you can see it is always growing. Okay? So deaths are affected. Your disability adjusted life years, which are an index of how long you will live with disability, those are increasing. Prevalence is growing. And you know, if you think about it, the demography of India is changing, and with that, the problem of dementia and the associated issues are growing. The problem of brain aging is growing. We've had studies in all these places, very happy to say that Chennai was something that we did. Uh, many, many years ago. Um, both urban and rural populations are affected by dementia. This is something that we have to understand. And the other thing that we have to understand is that the causality is multifactorial. The good news is what I was telling you about the holding factors and the lifestyle factors. Dementia is preventable. Okay. So dementia is real. It's a disease, it's not normal aging, but it is preventable. And this is something that we all need to keep in mind. Now, here's another very interesting fact. As you get older, see how many disorders you gain. So it's not just wealth that you might gain, not just weight that you might gain. You gain what we call multi-morbidity. The number of disorders you have, the number of diagnoses you have, go higher and higher. And by the time you are at 85 plus, you have eight diagnoses on average. Okay. So the healthcare needs of the elderly are considerable because of this multi morbidity. It's not just dementia that I have. I might have Parkinson's along with it. I might have stroke along with it. I might have arthritis along with it. I might have digestive issues along with it. In fact, most people I know who are older have problems with digestion. I may have neurogenic issues along with it. Uh, I might have peripheral issues, skin and uh, you know, neuropathy along with it. So in a sense, the needs keep climbing as you get older. The number of diagnoses you have have keep climbing also as you get older. And so pretty much every bodily system in some way will get affected as you get older. And this is something that we have to keep in mind. I'm going to get all of you to do a simple exercise to see whether your brain is aging or not. Okay? Put your hands up. Make a fist. Open your palm. Turn it to the side. Now repeat after me. Fist. Say fist. Palm. Side. Now let's do this together. Fist, palm, side. Fist, palm, side. Fist, palm, side. Fist, palm, side. Now who was struggling? If you struggled, right, then that's a sign of your brain executive not doing very, very well. And who described this? This gentleman called Luria. Now there's another very interesting thing that he said. Okay? He said that this part of your brain is for regulating tone. This part of your brain to analyze and store information, and this part of your brain, the frontal lobe, for programming, regulation, and verification of activity. Now, what he was trying to say was, you know, what you share with the rat, that's where your emotions come from. They are pretty primal. Okay? The front of the brain, which actually is huge, the frontal lobes, this is your decision maker. That's your executor. Okay? If you have emotional discontrol as you age, it's either because your emotional brain, which you share with the rat, has become overactive and this cannot control it anymore. Or this has become weak and even normal emotions it cannot control anymore. Alright. So in a sense, your brain works in circuits and even emotions and the regulation of emotions are governed by how different parts of the brain are working. And why am I saying this? These mechanisms also weaken as we age. How many of you have an older person in the family who sometimes says the most unacceptable things in company in front of everybody else? The point is, 
that that's because that decision making process is not working anymore the way it should work. I probably shouldn't say this. Right? This is not the right time to talk to this person. Whatever. That is what weakens as we get older. Right? The emotion to say something may come, the regulation is weak. Or just normal emotions come, the regulation is weak. So this is something that we all have to keep in mind. So what impacts our mental health? A very large proportion of older people have poor mental health as they age. Physical health starts to fail. Okay? You're forced to adapt. The world around you is changing. And you don't like the way it's changing. That causes you problems. Your social environment is changing. You become lonely because the near and dear are departing, starting to go. COVID taught us that. So many people lost people who were close to them during COVID. Insecurity started to kill, creep in. Sometimes they are physical insecurity, sometimes they are material, sometimes they are psycho-spiritual. Okay. I've had older people ask me repeatedly, what will happen when I die? It's a thought that comes to your mind as you get older. So these are things that happen and then of course memories become less sharp and less relevant. So an older person has many reasons why their mental health may get compromised. And that's something we need to understand, apart from the biological reasons we were just talking about. So what can you do? You can stay fit. Okay. I think this is Canada. They have a national senior health and fitness day. Okay. You can eat healthy. And if you Google online, you'll find many healthy eating pyramids. The pyramid is, things at the bottom of the pyramid are healthy stuff like fruit and vegetables that you eat every day or five to six days a week. Things at the top of the pyramid are things that are unhealthy for you that you restrict to two or three times a week. You can find this online. The best diet for older people is what's called the mind diet. Okay? And this comes from the Mediterranean diet, but I want to make one point here. The people who researched Mediterranean diets did not take one factor into consideration. They are consumed in salubrious surroundings, in company, over three or four hours. So eating a Mediterranean diet like that and running to work in 10 minutes is probably not going to protect your brain. You'll have to not just eat the Mediterranean diet, you'll have to live the way people in the Mediterranean regions do in order to protect your brain. And that's something that we all, most of us find very difficult to do in a country like ours. So, all we've had till now are drugs that influence neurotransmitters. And today, if you go to a hospital with dementia, what you're making is this. We have non pharmacological therapies. And that's a whole list. There are several things. There is emerging evidence that non pharmacological therapy is very useful for, for brain aging and disorders of brain aging, which means that drugs alone are not good enough. You need rehabilitation, you need non-pharmacological therapies, you could do yoga, you could do tai chi, you could do what's called reminiscence, there are many things that you could do. Today we have a very exciting world of neuromodulation that's developing and neuromodulation has great potential, stimulating your brain using a strong magnetic impulse or an electrical impulse or even giving yourself oxygen. These are things that actually can improve your brain function. So there is emerging evidence and a lot of interest there. But finally, that's the article that came out of the Hindu in which I collaborated a few days ago. There are new biologicals. And what do they do? They address antibodies. Okay. And in a sense, if you think about it, they are trying to eliminate the waste products that have got deposited in your brain in excess. And that's the most exciting thing that happened in dementia care. There was one called aducanumab. It did not show such a great effect despite accelerated approval. But we have dicanumab, which today is being looked at with a great deal of positivism. Uh, so these are new treatments. It's a different way of treating. And it's a little more in line with what Professor Lutger was talking about rather than many of the other therapies that we've been doing till now. What Dr. Rohini was saying, we have a Gothic philosophy. Medical care 
especially for vulnerable populations like disabled uh, children with developmental disorders, elderly with neurodegenerative disorders. It has to be in harmony. I don't believe it's an either or approach that's going to work. It's a multidisciplinary, multi-component, holistic approach that is going to help people with disorders of aging, but also right across the lifespan, people with any form of chronic disease. And so I'd like to stop by encouraging all of us to open our minds to aging, to dementia, to the possibility of multidisciplinary and holistic care. And, and finally, and most importantly, because we are hosting the Neuropsychiatry Roundtable, to neuropsychiatry as a speciality. This borderland between neurology and psychiatry is actually not small. It's very large. And there is going to be a time when uh, all these disorders will need this kind of integrated thinking and approach that we've been talking about right through today. With that, I'll say thank you very much. Thank you.